Hey everyone, we're so glad to be joining with you all today here online as we pick back up in our series, Do You Hear What I Hear? Because of Cantata last weekend, we'll be celebrating communion today. So I wanna invite you all to grab those supplies as we get started so we can all be a part of that later in the service. And as always, we have our team here to answer any questions you have and to pray with you this morning. So be sure to let us know how we can help or how to best pray for you anytime during the service. As we gather this morning, I believe that God has things for you and that he has things for me. We're not here to leave unchanged. And I hope that what we encounter in the moments ahead with God and with his people changes things for us. And it's gonna take us leaning in together this morning for that to happen. So as we sing and give and continue in Matthew and pray, let's participate in what God wants to do in and through us. Get ready for that as we head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Myra, and I have the honor and privilege of serving on our student ministry team. Whether you are joining us in the sanctuary or online, we are in for an incredible hour of worship this morning. If this is your first time here to Christ Chapel, welcome. And the seat back in front of you is what we call our Connect card. We ask that you fill it out with as much information as you feel comfortable with and drop that off in any of the offering boxes as you're leaving services this morning. And someone from our Christ Chapel staff will reach out to you to tell you a little bit more about our Christ Chapel family. In addition to our Connect card, we also have a place for you to write prayer requests. We believe in the power of prayer here, and it would be our honor to pray for you guys this week. You can write your prayer request as well on this Connect card and drop it off in any of the offering boxes as we are leaving. And our staff, leadership team, and prayer partners will be praying for you guys throughout the week. Well, if you're like myself, in the hustle and bustle of planning for the holiday season, things can get lost in the chaos, and we want to put two things on your radar. First, on Saturday, December 24th, we will be having Christmas Eve services across all three of our campuses as well as online. This is a great opportunity for you to invite friends, family, and neighbors to come hear about the love of Jesus Christ. For more information and reservation reminders, you can check out the Christ Chapel website. Website. Then on Sunday, December 25th, Christ Chapel is going home for the holidays. That's right. We want to go home with you for the holidays. This is an opportunity for us to connect with you and for you to invite people into your home to also hear about the love of Christ. We have created this unique worship experience just for you. It will include devotions from our campus pastors as well as your favorite holiday renditions of um, holiday songs. This is our gift from us to you, and we will hear more about how to uh, unpackage this gift at the end of Cody's sermon. We love worshiping with you, Christ Chapel family, and we are going to do just that this morning. But before we do that, how about we stand and say hello to those around us? Good morning, Christ Chapel. We are full swing in the holiday season. And as we enter in today, we just hope that you can fix your eyes on Jesus and just remember that he is the source of all joy. The greatest gift that ever could be is him. And so let's worship him this morning.
ever and ever. God, all the things that we've walked in with, that we've carried, the disappointment, the expectations not meant, the loved ones lost, none of it will hold or last. Father, because of your graciousness, because of your love, you sent us the greatest gift that ever could be. And so you will reign forever and we will be in paradise with you face to face. How can we not choose joy in the midst of that? It's in your name we pray, Father. Amen. Church, you can be seated. Well, again, good morning, Christ Chapel. This is a joyful morning. It's a great morning to worship. We're going to now enter into a time of giving. If you're a guest here, just know, let, us be, let this be a gift to you. Uh, our service. But if you are a regular attender here, we just want to point out a couple of ways that you can give. There's a, on our website, you can go there. There's a text to give message up as well. And there's also, you can just drop off uh, something in, uh, in the lobby out in one of the boxes out there. You know, at the end of the year, we, we always or oftentimes take up an end of the year offering. And so I just want to mention that as well. If uh, you're inclined to give something extra here at the end of the year, we do have some initiatives that are going on, uh, particularly We've had a lot of growth, actually, in our kids' programs, and there's certain of our kids' programs in our campuses that are outgrowing their facilities, so our end-of-the-year giving is going towards that. We've also seen some growth in actual groups. There's a group down in Granbury. They started in just a small group, and they've actually grown to the point that they're requiring some facilities and some equipment as well. And then something a little bit closer to my heart is uh, we... We do uh, theological education all around the world, in Africa, in India, in Latin America, and part of our end-of-year giving will be going towards those endeavors as well. So just put that in your, uh, in your hearts and pray about it, and let me just lead us in prayer as we bless this offertory. Father, we, uh, we're grateful that you are the giver of everything to us. We know that that's true, and this season really celebrates that. Father, we just thank you that we have an ability to worship you uh, in return through just trusting you through our, our tithes and our offerings. So use it to your glory. It's in your son's name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. Uh, and not to all a good night, it's a good morning. Uh, and at this point, I know that I usually say hello to all of those at our other campuses, and certainly glad that you chose to worship with us. But uh, one of the things I realized is you guys might not have a context for what goes on at those other campuses that we often say hello to. Uh, there are hundreds of men, women, and children who meet at those other campuses, and those campuses are led by campus pastors. They each have their own campus pastor, and the campus pastor's role is to help care for and, and shepherd their needs, that congregation's needs, uh, throughout the week, through the ups and downs of life. Uh, certainly, they help us uh, fulfill that vision, be, make, and reach, be disciples, make disciples, reach those who do not yet know or walk with Jesus. And then they help contextualize those initiatives for those particular communities. How can we reach those particular communities, specifically in Johnson County, Parker County, and certainly here in Tarrant County, 
also. So you might not have known that, and you might not even know who those campus pastors are. Well, at the West Campus, we have a campus pastor there named Matt Lance. And Matt and Darcy, there's Matt and uh, their kids, and Darcy and their kids. Um, Matt took over for me when I left the West Campus four years ago. And so he's been the campus pastor there uh, for that duration. And then at the South Campus, we have Micah Barnum. There's Micah and Holly and their kids. And Micah and Holly have been here for over two decades decades now uh, at different roles, but do a great job. Both of them do a great job of shepherding their people, helping them to be, make, and reach, and contextualizing those particular needs for their community. Now, here's a good question for you. Who is the Fort Worth campus pastor? (laughs) Yeah, your nervous laughter is me. Yeah, and, and that's what some people would say. I have the same thing. And some people would go, well, Cody, you are the Fort Worth campus pastor. And as much as I would love to be the Fort Worth campus pastor, I cannot be the Fort Worth campus pastor and the lead pastor of a multi-site church. I cannot help care for your daily needs at the Fort Worth campus the same way that Matt does for the West Campus and Micah does for the South Campus and lead those other initiatives. And the good news is we have some biblical models about what to do to help care for God's people. You have Exodus 18 with Moses and Jethro. You have Acts chapter 6 with the elders and the deacons because God wants his people to be cared for. That's what he wants. And that's my heart too, is that each of our campuses would have people who are well-fed, well cared for spiritually. And so back in 2019, uh, our leadership began talking about employing and empowering a Fort Worth campus pastor. And this would be a tall task, uh, certainly, because whoever that would be certainly has to have and embody the Christ Chapel uh, DNA, has to have a history of leading a large staff, has to be able to connect with multiple different generations and also has to certainly be able to be a presence in the pulpit. And so as we began to pray about those things, uh, the, the decision uh, became very clear and very obvious. And our elders uh, unanimously decided that the Fort Worth campus pastor should be Ben Fuquay. And uh, yeah. So there's Ben and Danielle, and they've been here for almost 15 years, and he's had a variety of different roles. And right now, uh, one of his particular roles is with the college ministry and uh, young adults. In fact, that's where he is this morning, is he's preaching over there at the end of their series on Galatians, And uh, but you'll be able to see him next week as he preaches in the pulpit. Uh, but uh, just some quick FAQs, uh, Ben is not leaving his directional leadership over young adults or college ministry. Uh, He will still uh, participate in those particular ministries. He's not uh, leaving anyone in college or young adults, uh, but he is taking on this uh, extra responsibility. And the reason why we're doing this, again, is so that you can be well cared for. We need to continue to make every effort that we can to make the big church feel smaller. You need to have relationships and you need to be cared for in the context of community. And so that's what I want. That's what our leadership wants is for you to be well cared for. And now some of you might ask, Cody, if Ben comes to help at the Fort Worth campus, what are you going to (laughs) do? Uh, Great question. Um, I I will still continue to partner with the campus pastors to to pastor as many people as I can. Uh, I love each and every one of you. I want to get to know you and shepherd you and those at the other campuses. Uh, And this will help me get to know some folks at those other campuses and even reconnect with folks at the West Campus that I've had relationships with since I was their campus pastor. Uh, But also continue to work with the elders as far as discerning God's direction for our future. I'll continue to be the consistent messenger so that we have a consistent message and methodology for ministry. And I'll continue to obviously uh, preach and uh, guide the teaching from the pulpit. So uh, I'm not going anywhere. I don't have any plans on going anywhere. Fort Worth Campus just gets the addition 
of having been as boots on the ground to care for you. And I know he loves you. I know he's excited about this. He's already been working on this behind the scenes, and you'll get to hear from him next week in the pulpit. So super excited about this season for our church. But this week, it's my turn in the pulpit. So if you will, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Uh, we are going to continue our series, obviously. Uh, do you hear what I hear as we continue our series in Matthew? If you're opening one of those blue Bibles, it's page 834. This is actually the second to last sermon that we're going to have in the Gospel of Matthew, which is honestly kind of sad for me. It's been a really great time and a really great study. And so we are going to be speeding through the end of Matthew here and beginning in the new year, beginning on January. 8th, we are actually going to keep the story going, and we are going to start a year-long study through the book of Acts. And so really excited about that for our church as we look at how the early church reached out to those around them as we are called to reach those in our own communities as well. But let's talk about the thing that's on everybody's mind right now, and that is gifts. G-I-F-T-S. It's on all of your minds. You're all thinking about the gifts that you want, the gifts that you have to give, because at this time of year, we have those customary gift exchanges where you agree that, whether it's said explicitly or it's just implicit, that you're going to exchange gifts with particular friends and families. And so uh, maybe even somebody's asked you to compile a list of things you want, and so you begin to make your list, and then you think about what you're going to give to to them, and this gift exchange happens at whatever time you've determined. Now, the thing that nobody wants to think about is that usually during the Christmas season, there's a double exchange. And I don't mean that just two people are exchanging gifts. I mean the gift that you put time, effort, energy, maybe even prayer into could potentially be exchanged by the receiver. Does that not chap your hide? (laughs) That the gift that you gave to them, they might receive and they go, you know, I wanted a different color or I need a different size or I want something different altogether. And so they take your gift and they go and they exchange it. Nobody likes to think about those things. And if we're honest, Every single one of us has that thought. You think, is it better to just get a gift card with this? You know, so every gift exchange, it doesn't matter if it's with your friends or family, turns into a white elephant gift exchange. You you know what that is, where regardless of what you receive, you might not end up with. Because you're going to open it and then you're going to keep your eye out for the things that other people get that you might want instead. It's the cutthroat Christmas exchange that puts everybody in the Christmas spirit. You know, it's what everybody wants to do. And so this gift exchange happens and then a double exchange can occur. And the thing that I've realized is, and and I I think about it too, when I think about exchanging the gifts that I receive is really, this is a season of wishing and wanting that we all have. And it doesn't just apply to these material gifts that we exchange on a regular basis. But really, this season also makes us reflect on things that we wish we would have. And I'm not talking about just a sweater. I'm talking about during this time, we think, could I have a better job? Could, could I have a, a, a better friendship? Could I have a better family? Could I have a better home? Could we have a better X or Y? And we all have these thoughts of exchanging what is for what we wish could be. But the real question is, is it worth an exchange? Is it worth exchanging what we have now for what we think we want or what we wish could be because that exchange doesn't always work out in our favor. And that's what we're gonna talk about today because today in Matthew chapter 27, we're gonna look at the most infamous exchange in all of history. 
And it was an exchange that's recorded in Scripture. And so what I want to do today is I want to explain what this exchange was. And then I want to give you some uh, introspective questions for you to reflect on so that you can ask yourself, was that worth it? And think about the exchanges that we make on a daily basis, wondering if it's worth us, uh, worth it for us as well. And then I'll give you some application. So let me give you some context as far as where we are in the gospel of Matthew, because Jesus, as we uh, talked about two weeks ago, uh, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane when Ted preached and he talked about what to do when you're in the press. I talked about the olive press, did a great job. Um, and so now Jesus has been turned over to the religious leaders of the day. He's been arrested. And now the religious leaders put him on trial and they think he's blasphemous. He said that he's God, so they want him killed. And, but the religious leaders don't have the authority to do that, so they have to turn Jesus over to the Roman government who has the authority of the sword. They can kill people. They can punish people. And so the religious leaders take Jesus and put him on trial in front of Pilot, and that's where we're going to get this opportunity to exchange that we're going to talk about today. And so what I want you to see in these few verses in chapter 27, beginning in verse 15, is a customary exchange is going to present a great opportunity. A customary exchange is going to present a great opportunity. Look at verses 15 to 18. It says, now at the, feast of the gov- uh, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, well, whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Now, we're going to stop right there. So let me explain what is going going on here. So the feast is important to understand because it's the Passover feast, and that's important for so many different reasons. But what's important to understand for this context is this was the feast that Jews from all over made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So there are a ton of Jews in Jerusalem at this time. Okay? A lot of people who don't like the Roman government are here. And Pilate is basically going through and questioning Jesus. And he doesn't want a, a riot on his hands. And really, that's the only reason why Pilate is there is because he's supposed to be, it says governor, another word is procurator, or he's, he's a peacekeeper. Rome put him there to keep the peace amongst the people. Now, the Jews don't like the Roman government and the authority that they have over them. And so now he's got, Pilate has this thing going on where he's got some upset Jews and not just a few, a handful, a bunch of upset Jews on his hands, and he doesn't need a riot. But the problem is, is that he knows that Jesus is innocent. In fact, four times throughout this this account, he says, Jesus is innocent. There's no reason to kill him. So he knows that, but he doesn't know what to do. How do I keep all of these people happy and so that they don't cause a riot, but how do I get Jesus off my hands? I I don't need him here. And so he presents this idea of a customary exchange. Now, it seems as this custom was just made up by Pilate, and not necessarily at this particular time, but just in his tenure that this was a local custom that he made up, that during this feast, he would always release one of their prisoners so that they could have people, and it would be an act of goodwill, a way to appease them, to have a good relationship with the Jews. So he decides, okay, this is pretty sly and cunning. I'm going to present the customary exchange, and maybe I can give Jesus back to them. Well, remember, they had already given Jesus to him, So how is he going to get them to want Jesus back? The way that he thinks he can do it is by offering Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, one of the things that you need to know about him, and it says it right here in the text, is he was an infamous prisoner, an infamous prisoner. 
Like everybody knew this guy was a criminal. He was a murderer and an insurrectionist that we understand from uh, Mark. So he is an infamous, like everybody knew him. And he goes, maybe if I offer this infamous prisoner, may, there's no way they're going to accept him. They'll have to take back Jesus because it's either or. It would be like today if, you know, they're like, hey, you know, if, do you want Jesus or Charles Manson? You know, which, which one do you want? You'd go, surely nobody's going to choose Charles Manson. Nobody's going to choose him. They're all, always going to choose Jesus. Wrong. They, they, they end up, spoiler alert, they end up choosing Barabbas. And you go, why do they do that? Well, there's a key in here that he talks. If you look, if you look back at verse 18, what he's trying to do is, is get them to take Jesus back. But then it says, but he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered them up. Well, what were they envious of? What were the religious leaders envious of that day of Jesus? It was his power. He had sway over the people. He was the one who was the miracle worker. He was doing these great things. And he was becoming greater, and they were becoming less. And they didn't like that. They didn't want somebody stepping into their sway, into their influence, into living the life that they had made. They didn't want anybody intruding on their way of life, their uh, prestige in a sense. And so they end up saying, hey, we'll take Barabbas rather than Jesus. Now at this point, when we're thinking about this account, uh, I think pretty much every single one of us goes, I would never make that same decision. I would never ask for Barabbas instead of Jesus. But that's why I wanna ask you some of these introspective questions along the way, because I think all of us trade Jesus every day for other things. Because all of us make that decision every day where we go, do I really want Jesus telling me what to do? Do I really want to do what the Bible says? Probably not. So you know what? I'll trade myself for Jesus. My way for his way. I don't want his way. I want my way. And that's essentially what they were doing then. And so the first introspective question for you is this. Assess why you want what you want. And I'm giving you these questions. Certainly, you can apply it to your Christmas wish list that you're making for loved ones or those you'll exchange gifts with. But really, for you to reflect on as we think about this, exchanging what we have for what we wish could be, why do you want that? What, what is the reason? Mo motives matter. Is it out of envy? Is it, are they good motives? Certainly, there, there are great things that you go, Cody, this is worth it, I promise. Great, awesome, praise God. But search your heart first because things might not work out better in the end because of the motive that you had in the beginning. I think that's what is going on here when he talks about the envy that they had in their heart. Uh, if you look back at James chapter four, James chapter four, uh, he asks the question and he asks it rhetorically. He says, what is it, that, this is verse one of James chapter four, he says, what is it that causes uh, quarrels and strife among you? Is it not your own selfish desires? The, the conflict that we find with other people is oftentimes because the, the conflict that we have within. It, it's, it's we aren't content or satisfied with the things that we have that God has blessed us with, that God has given us. And oftentimes, our wants trample on other people's desires. That's what puts us in conflict with each other. And so I think we've got to assess why do we want what we want. It's funny, uh, my boys love Dude Perfect. I don't know if you know Dude Perfect, who I think are wonderful guys, by the way. Uh, they have a wonderful Christian witness, so praise God for them. Um, but anyway, my boys love them. And I was, Dax, my, our 11-year-old, I was talking with him the other day, and he goes, Dad, uh, he, was, he had just watched Dude Perfect. He said, Dad, 
I want to be famous. And I said, I don't think you do. You got to be careful what you wish for. And it got us into a great conversation about why do you want to be famous? Why do you want those things? In a great way that, that we've all had the same desires that he had that made him say that. We've all had those. But asking ourselves, assessing, why do you want what you want is very important because those things will be tested. And they're tested in the next few verses. You see, because this opportunity to exchange was accompanied with peer pressure. It's accompanied with peer pressure. You see, it was a great opportunity. Why? Because they could have turned back. They could have said, you know what? We're wrong. We should have never delivered Jesus over to you. We want him back. And they didn't take that. And this opportunity now has been filled with peer pressure. Look at verses 20 and 21. It says, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor again said to them, which of these two do you want me to release for you? You see, he keeps asking the same question because he, he knows the right answer. He wants them to change their mind, and they're not changing their mind. And they said, Barabbas. So you can see how the mob mentality is, is coming together. The crowd, again, remember, there's so many Jews here for this Passover feast uh, that have made their pilgrimage to the land, and they're getting whipped up into a frenzy by these religious leaders who are saying, ask for Barabbas, ask for Barabbas, don't, don't for Jesus, and they're, they're trying to work the grapevine in that way, and this mob mentality begins to rise up, and Pilate begins to feel the pressure from them, but he's not only feeling pressure externally from the, from the crowd, he's also got the internal pressure from himself. I mean, he knows the right thing to do. I just told you earlier, four times he's going, I know you're innocent. I know you haven't done anything wrong. I know you shouldn't be killed or crucified. He has that in his own mind and heart, knows what's right to do. So he's got the external pressure from the crowd. He's got the internal pressure from himself. And then, if that's not enough, he's got marital pressure from his wife. Some of you guys laughed. Yeah. His wife comes to him. Look back. Look back. This isn't on your sermon notes, but look in, in the text here. It says that, uh, verse 19, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat where he makes these judgments and proclamations, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. Don't have anything to do with him. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. She knows the right thing to do is, listen, let him go. So he's got pressure now from his wife. He's feeling all of these pressures. That's why you've got to understand why you want what you want. But another question that you've got to ask yourself is, who wants you to want what you want? Who wants you to want what you want? One commentator called this section the plight of, of an unprincipled man. I thought that's a really good line. The plight of an unprincipled man because essentially what we find out about Pilate is he doesn't have any principles. He, he's playing the whole political game. This is all about politics. This is all about popularity and trying to do just enough to appease this person and just enough to appease this person. You're gonna see in just a second, he tries to do enough to appease his wife. He tries to do enough to appease the crowd, uh, but he doesn't please himself except for that he pleases everyone else, which pleases him. See, this is a weird thing. It's a weird whole thing when you start thinking about how to live your life without principles. One of the things we, we talk about in our family all the time is being people, men and women, obviously with my wife, being people of conviction, knowing who we are and what we're called to, 
Because that, those things don't change based on what people want us to do or what people think we should do. That's why this is important to ask the question, who wants you to want what you want? Is there somebody influencing you to want these particular things? Because honestly, sometimes just, people just want a partner in crime. They, they don't want to feel bad about the decisions they're making, and they'll feel, uh, they won't feel as bad if they have someone along with them for that ride. And you go, listen, don't destroy your life to assuage someone else's conscience. That doesn't make any sense. And so our, and, and even, hey, that's, that's an extreme example, but even take a, 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 a wants uh, thing, you know, where we talk about this time of year trying to keep up with the Joneses. Why do I want that? Well, because they have that, and they want me to have that. Well, do you need that? This uh, is a good question during this season of wishing and wanting is who wants you to want what you want? Because sometimes when we begin to uh, try to appease people, what we realize and at the heart of it, at the crux of it, what we're doing is we're trading Jesus to win a popularity contest. And that doesn't matter in the end, and it doesn't matter here, because what you'll see is that this choice to exchange had individual consequences. This choice to exchange had individual consequences. Look at verses 24 to 26. It says, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, meaning gaining nothing with the crowd, the ones that were about to riot, But rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. See, there are going to be consequences for all of those involved. Some are welcome and some are unwelcome. The the welcomed ones are, obviously the crowd said, hey, let his blood be on our heads. We'll we'll take those those consequences, which is obviously very short-sighted. But Pilate doesn't want the consequences for his decision. And so what does he do? He washes his hands. That's where we get our our phrase these days. I wash my hands of it. I'm not going to have anything else to do with it. Trying to show himself as innocent. Problem. Just because he declares himself innocent does not make him innocent. Reminds me of one of my favorite scenes in the show The Office, if you've ever seen the show The Office, with Michael Scott. And some of you are like, this is a left turn. It is, but it's a great scene. Uh, when uh, Michael is having all the financial problems with Jan, and Jan's running up all his credit cards and maxing them all out, and he's feeling the pressure, and, and he's like, he talks about you know, how he should go into bankruptcy, and he walks out of his office to declare bankruptcy, and he goes, I declare bankruptcy. And Oscar, the accountant, comes by and goes, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> Remember? Okay. So that's what Pilate is doing here. I mean, he's declaring, I declare myself innocent. I don't think that's how that works. I don't think just because you declare yourself innocent means that you're innocent. Because who is responsible for crucifying Jesus? Well, it's under his authority. It's under Pilate's authority here. He's the one who scourges him and hands him over, as it says here in this passage, hands him over to be crucified. So I think one of the things in this season of wishing, one thing we've got to assess is what you'll get if you get what you want. What are you actually going to get if you get what you want? You know, this, this is a season two, and I... I want to say this. This is season two where I know that there can be a, a lot of relational strife amongst people, a lot. And let me just caution you. Um, if you trade those relationships for a different relationship, you're just going to be in a relationship with another sinner. 
And don't forget, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Uh, let's not be so quick to trade and exchange these things. Let's, let's pause a moment. And, and I know that sounds so basic, but really, as I said earlier, the, that crowd is very short-sighted in what they're asking for there. Pilate is very short-sighted in what he is giving them, thinking that he can give them Barabbas, crucify Jesus, and this is all over. That, let's just make the quick decision that provides us relief immediately. It's impulsive, and they don't think beyond. And I think sometimes the things that we need to do in our own life is simply pause. Don't be impulsive. And this is a season where advertisers are asking you to be impulsive. Buy now, pay later. It's, it's the act on impulse. Don't worry about the consequences. No, think about the consequences. Please do, because these folks don't. And it doesn't turn out well for them. That's why we've got to assess what you'll get if you get what you want. So here's the, the bottom line to the whole thing. What I want you to hear from this passage is to exchange the wrong things for the right things. Exchange the wrong things for the right things. And here's what I mean. These folks in this passage, they exchanged the right thing. They exchanged Jesus for power, for popularity, for immediate pleasure, this immediate satisfaction. They traded the right thing and they got all the wrong things instead. And it needs to be the other way around. Trade the wrong things for the right things. And the right thing is obviously Jesus because guess what? There's only one person in this passage who it works out well for. Do you know who it is? It's Barabbas. He's, he's the only person who this works out well for. And why does it work out well for him? Because he was a notorious criminal. He's a murderer. He had already been through a trial, convicted and condemned. But because Jesus takes his place, he's set free. You see, don't, don't miss this. There are exchanges that God is okay with. And the main one is exchanging his son for you. See, one of the things you don't, that isn't necessarily apparent, is that the name Barabbas means son of the father. And there's certainly that the religious leaders of that day would have known that play on words, that here's a man who claims to be the son of the father, and he's being exchanged so that this man can become a son of the father. <laughs> you can become a child of the father by exchanging your life for his. He's okay with that exchange by placing your trust in Jesus Christ for what he's done for you when he paid your penalty because you were convicted and condemned for your own sin, but he paid the penalty for your sin so that you could be set free the same way Barabbas was set free at that moment in an instant to trade your life for his. And if you've already made that decision, here's what I hope you would consider the rest of the time during this season, is think about the other exchanges that God's okay with. He's okay to exchange sin for forgiveness. He's okay to exchange regret for hope. He's okay to exchange sorrow for joy. He's okay to exchange bitterness for, for, for hope. He, he's okay with some of those exchanges, and it began with him setting that precedent with his life. So don't exchange the right things for the wrong things. Make sure this season you're exchanging the wrong things for the right things. Let me pray for us. God, we all thank you that you chose to take our place, to exchange yourself for us, that even when we stood convicted and condemned, 
you said, she's mine and he's mine. Lord Jesus, I'm just struck by how in this passage you, you could have stepped out of that. You, you could have saved yourself and instead you chose to save Barabbas. Lord, thank you that you chose to save us. Let us not exchange you on a daily basis, but accept you and everything you have to offer that you want us to receive. In your name, amen. Well, I can't think of a a better thing that we could do together as a family than celebrate the Lord's Supper together uh, after hearing that message. You know, I I loved Cody's second question, that is we need to assess uh, who wants us to want what we want. And what I know about that is that God wants us to want Him. And how do I know that? Because of exactly what we're about to celebrate today, that there was an exchange that happened that, and it was symbolized in the Lord's Supper where Jesus exchanged his righteousness for our sin and he took our sin upon himself so that we could have his righteousness and be in relationship with God. And in fact, uh, Paul tells us in Corinthians, he gives us some context. He says it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that this happened. That is, it was the worst night perhaps of his life and yet on the worst night of his life, he was thinking about us so that on the worst or even the best night of our lives, we can be thinking about him. And so he gave us the Lord's Supper. You know, if you've placed your, your faith, your hope in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a time for you. You know, if you haven't yet done that, now's the time. Cody expressed it and I expressed it too. Receive him today as that gift. Receive that exchange. And let's celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together as a family. And if you haven't quite got there yet, that's okay too. We just would ask that you would refrain. But we, uh, let's have our elements get those uh, ready. We hear in the book of Corinthians that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take and eat. Likewise, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray together as a family. Father, thank you for this exchange. Thank you that you took uh, the spirit of Barabbas that exists in all of us and you exchanged it for your life. So that just like Barabbas was set free in in a physical sense, we are set free in a spiritual and a physical sense that we know you and love you as our Lord and Savior now and forever. It's your son's name, Christ, that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me? How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows Finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
Seal the promise Your very body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declares the grave Has no claim on me Amen Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your very body Began to
Amen. Thank you, uh, team. Yeah, hope has a name as Emmanuel. He didn't just come. He came to exchange his life uh, for yours and for mine. Uh, if you're joining us online, thanks so much for doing so. Please stick around. Owen's got some things for you. And if you're a guest here in the sanctuary, so glad that you chose to spend a part of your weekend with us. And we'd love to get to know you a little bit more. Best way to do that is if you would go out into the great room and you'll see a screen that looks just like that and a, a pastor that can answer any questions that you might have about our church. We'd love to begin to walk with you. Maybe you don't know this Jesus that we talk about. We'd love to introduce you to him and help you grow in your faith with him. Also, if you need prayer for anything, we'd love to be able to pray for you. Uh, please hang out after the service. We'll have some folks down here that can lift up anything that might be uh, on your heart. I know this season can be uh, certainly heavy sometimes. Uh, no reason to carry that alone. Uh, no reason to carry it out of this room. So please let us uh, pray with you today. Uh, also, please go ahead and make those plans to join us on Christmas Eve. Uh, these are those inviter cards uh, that show you where you can get those reservation reminders. Uh, what I would ask is that anybody, if you call Christ Chapel home, would you consider going to one of the earliest hours or one of the latest hours? Uh, we're going to be hosting a lot of guests, certainly at those prime times, like 4.30. Uh, if it means it makes no difference to you or means no difference, then please, you know, come to like to the 130 service or come uh, if you like traditional come to the 930 service if you like uh, contemporary this contemporary team will be here uh, for that late night service and would love to be able to worship with you I'll be here preaching that one live uh, as well so uh, please make those reservation reminders that reserves you a seat to sit a place to park and certainly there's a place for children under the age of three to have children's ministry that day also just grab a few of these they're out in the great room I took three or four and I'm just handing them out to the people that I see uh, during the week. And so take them, give them to your friends, neighbors, coworkers. And then also at that website is gonna be a place where you can uh, get your free Christmas gift from Christ Chapel. Uh, that is, we are going home with you. That's the Christmas day gift. And so you can sign up for that online or text in the short code that is on the screen. Just text GIFT to 24253 so that you can see our smiling faces Christmas morning too. I know that's exactly what you wish for. You're like, no, I'll exchange that. See, that's good. You're applying the sermon. Exchange the wrong things for the right things. God bless you. We love you. See you. I'm glad you joined in today and hope you have a great week until we're back together again for our last Sunday in Matthew, at least for right now. Remember to let us know how we can best pray for you today and throughout the week before you head into the rest of Sunday. And during the week, you can use that info you'll see right after this to reach out to me if anything comes up. We're now less than two weeks away from our Christmas Eve services. And remember to make your plans to join in if you already have them. We have services across all of our venues and just to make sure we have enough space for everyone, we ask that you let us know if you'll be attending in person by reserving that time on our website. A link to that's in the chat right now. It's going to be a great celebration of Jesus, and we're excited to join with you in that. We've enjoyed sharing in these moments with you and look forward to the moments when we're together again as we wrap up Matthew next Sunday. Thanks for being a part today, and we'll see you then.